and welcome to the Business Growth Show, where we talk about all components of business and how to utilize them for exponential growth. My name is Nathan Cassiotis. I'm a business growth expert who help business owners grow and scale to create wealth and freedom. Today, I have an awesome guest. His name is Brett Story, and he's the founding partner at Brighthorn Partners and Brighthorn Securities, m and specialist, board member, and investor. And he specializes in arming business owners, management teams, and boards with the information they need to decide when to sell a business or raise capital. And then his team skillfully executes those transformative and often life-changing transactions. He's a big picture strategist with a passion for figuring out how all the pieces fit together. As a company founder and leader, he embraces business development and prides himself in helping identify and drive corporate strategy and has a track record of navigating a variety of legal and regulatory regimes in the best interests of management, employees, and shareholders. And in 2013, he founded Brighthorn Partners, a full-service investment banking practice that takes privately held middle market companies through a corporate M&A or capital raise process. And his team is comprised of senior investment bankers from a variety of backgrounds and approaches deals with creativity, determination, and the skill critical to close complex transactions in the best interests of its clients. And Brighthorn Partners owns Brighthorn Securities, an FINRA slash SEC registered broker dealer that specializes in managing compliance needs for investment bankers, institutional placement agents, and private capital funds. And outside of Brighthorn, resident investor and member of the board of directors of ARB Labs Inc. and a technology company serving the, the casino gaming industry based in Toronto, an investor and advisory board member for York RLFC, a professional rugby league club based in York, England. Welcome, Brett Story, and thank you for being on my show. Ethan, I'm excited. Thanks for having me. You're welcome, mate. I'm sure it's going to be great for everyone watching and listening today. So you're a successful entrepreneur. So for those people who don't know who you are, please introduce yourself by telling us more about you and your journey. Thanks so much. Uh, a lot of trial and error. Um, I call myself a recovering lawyer. Uh, I graduated from, from law school and got involved in, in corporate law um, about 15, 16 years ago now. And in the course of that journey, uh, I really discovered that I enjoyed mergers and acquisitions and helping um, put business transactions together. I initially started doing it at the large public company level here in the United States, and, as well as um, Canadian and UK companies, and then went to work for a smaller firm, which really whet my appetite for working with uh, family and founder-owned businesses. I remember uh, one of the most impactful transactions I had. Uh, the, the pleasure of being a part of was a gentleman who started a publishing business uh, out of his garage. That tells you how long ago it was. And uh, he had mortgaged his house to the hilt, um, had been through some real personal struggles and was really all in on the business. And when we executed the transaction, I think he walked away with something in the neighborhood of $40 million US and was actually in tears at the closing table as he was signing uh, the contract. And that that was really gratifying to see somebody win like that. So um, transitioned from the practice of law, met my, my now partners uh, 12 years ago. We founded Brighthorn and have done just shy of a billion dollars worth of transactions over the last 10 or 12 years, uh, really working with uh, business owners who, who want to capitalize in on their life's work and, and, and sell their companies. So it's been a great run. Yeah, awesome, mate. I love hearing the start of the journey and, and where it's taking you. Yeah, some great skills because, uh, yeah, you need to know about the law and then what you can and can't do with, with everything and then how you can then translate that now. The business owners is great, um, you know, from there as well. So let's um, let's talk a bit about the current market. I think it's always good now, right? We're at the start of 2024. Uh, I know in Australia, things are looking up now, like, you know, from, from inflation's gone down a lot, you know, everything like that. So it, we're in a better position. Uh, I'm not sure, I'd be interested to hear from the US side of things as well, but what, how is it, do you think now for business owners, like considering to, you know, to sell their business? It's a great time. Um, it's interesting because our, our segment is really business owners in the sort of 10 to a hundred million of revenue mark. And th the macro sentiment, whether it's interest rates or inflation or, this recession that they've been talking about, but it's never come. Um, it, it affects sentiment as much as it actually affects, uh, you know, boots on the ground. And so the first half of last year, everyone was just a little bit gun shy uh, to, to pull the trigger um, and, and execute on a transaction. I had a lot of sellers that were fearful about what interest rates would do to company valuations, because obviously if the cost of debt capital is higher, 
buyers are willing to pay less, are willing to put in less equity on deals um, as a general rule, not always. Um, and, and on the buyer side, um, folks were adjusting their models to reflect the new, the new interest rate environment. Um, that all seemed to flip last summer. And um, we had a successful year last year. I'm very optimistic about 24 and 25, barring some black swan event. Um, and downstream where we play, you know, these deals are driven as much by personal reasons, founders getting older or wanting to spend more time with family or feeling like uh, they're exposed because their whole net worth is tied up with this one business um, as, it, as it is, you know, the dollars and cents and, and cost of debt capital. So it's a good environment to, uh, to contemplate selling a, a company. And I think that's going to continue this year and next. Yeah, nice. Awesome. Good to hear. And um, let's talk about preparation because I think preparation is key, whether you're playing sport or you're selling a business, right? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's important. So how do, you know, business owners need to prepare? Um, and, and I guess as well is how long can this take to, you know, to make people aware of that as well? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And, um, you know, I put out a piece on LinkedIn, the sort of five, five steps of selling, um, you know, the first thing that they need to do is get their, get their house in order. Um, that means, you know, financials up to, you know, accounting standards. That means legal due diligence, corporate documents, and the earlier, the better, right? Because if you're growing a business and especially if it's growing quickly, these sellers are wearing a lot of different hats. And sometimes the mundane corporate documents and corporate financials can, can kind of get pushed aside because there's not an urgency. Um, but that, that can compound and, and it can be harder and harder to get sorted and, and fixed uh, the more you put it off. So anybody who's thinking about selling, um, you know, 18 months to 24 months out can really start now by getting uh, their corporate house in order. And then, and then you want to clarify your goals. Why am I wanting to sell? Um, and, and what is the, what is the outcome that I'm striving for both financially and personally? And, and that can, run a full spectrum, um, get clear on, on those goals, um, and then surround yourself with the right advisors, legal, accounting, investment banking to, to execute on these deals. Um, and, you know, the right team is super important, not only to, to get you the best terms when you're, when you're selling the business, but also to allow you to keep your eye on the ball, so to speak, and continue running the company. Because the worst thing that can happen is you can go through a sale process, it fall through for whatever reason, and you've taken your eye off the ball and business has suffered. And then you're actually in a worse place than you were if you had never pursued a deal. So that, those are some of the things that we encourage people to think about. Yeah, nice. No, awesome. And I guess let's, let's talk about the size of business because I know you talked about you, you, you're dealing with you know, 10 to 100 million in terms of revenue. Um, mm -hmm. you know, what are you looking at? Like, th does it matter? Because obviously, from my understanding, the bigger the business in terms of obviously profit, the most industries and EBITDA is, um, you know, the bigger the multiple as well. So, you know, is there an ideal size that you think, or as long as they're over that sort of 10 million mark, then, you know, that they'll, you know, it'll be a better place for a multiple and, and how it, I guess it affects, you know, their valuation. Let's put SaaS uh, software as a service businesses off to the side for a second and talk about, you know, services, businesses, manufacturing, industrials. Um, as a rule of thumb, you know, up to 5 million of EBITDA will, will tend to have a certain multiple attached depending on the industry and how fast the business is growing. Once you get north of 5 million, and these are U.S. dollars, uh, of EBITDA, it's nonlinear. So, so the, the, the multiple jumps, uh, you know, in, a, in an exponential almost fashion, and then sort of once you're over 10 million of EBITDA uh, again, and, and that's to reflect the different um, buyer universes that are attracted at different size ranges. And it's, you know, simple supply and demand. Once you're north of 10 million of EBITDA, you tend to be of a requisite size for most um, private equity firms in, in North America to really be interested. And, and so you're going to create much more of a competitive dynamic versus if you're at two or three million of EBITDA, um, you, you tend to be um, appealing to a, a smaller subset of buyers. Now, um, SaaS businesses get really interesting at four or five million of recurring revenue, very interesting at 10 um, and so it's less about um, EBITDA and profitability for SaaS businesses and more about top line growth. 
Yeah, nice. Yeah, I was reading the other day that a lot of the most wealthiest people got wealthy because of software, right? Because of like businesses like that, um, IT sort of side of things and big valuations and things. So it def definitely helps when it's looking at revenue compared to profit, <laughs> you know, with more. Yeah, for sure. And, and, and you know, the, the entire venture capital ecosystem on the West Coast uh, really, you know, was born to, to serve software and, and software businesses are attractive because the margins explode at scale because as a general rule, the, there's a sunk cost, there's a fixed cost, there's some sales and marketing costs. But, but once you've really got that, you can, you can scale with the click of a button in a way that you can't if you're selling office cleaning equipment or some other, some other product that, that involves a lot more um, margin, you know, a, as you go. Yeah. Nice. Um, so let's just talk about, we talk, you mentioned private equity there because you know, you've got that, you've got obviously angel investors that are lower, but we're looking at the bigger end of town. Um, how do we, how do we go in and find this? Is this, is this working with somebody like yourself as you relationships? And then is it like, but there's also, I guess, strategic sales, right? That can happen at the same mm -hmm. time where you go, Hey, well, the private equity might own them already, or it could be someone else that you're going, well, it'd be a great bolt on. So is this some of the strategy things going, okay, well, what options do we have um, to, you know, when we're going through that, that sales process? Yeah, exactly. Right. I think, um, you know, I would, strongly encourage anybody thinking of selling their business to work with a competent investment banker or M&A advisor, because that person's going to, or that firm's going to have access to a broad swath of buyers. And that's really the key in maximizing not only the financial terms, but the, the non-financial terms, what you want your life to look like after you close the deal, et cetera. And, and you're right. I mean, if you think about it, you've got private equity broadly, which consists of private equity buyout firms, firms that focus on growth capital, venture, you know, angel investing, family offices. And then, and then you've got strategic buyers who tend to be within the same industry, some of whom can be owned by private equity, um, some of whom not. And, you know, those two buckets come with different sets of motivations, different deal criteria, but it's a great blend of both that creates the most competitive and, and fruitful sale process. And that's, that's what we do um, well in advance of taking a company to market is really survey the landscape, figure out who, you know, what, what, what categories of buyers are, are the right fit, depending on a, a particular seller's objectives. Yeah, nice. Love that. Um, you know, what happens, let's just say you do the numbers, right? You come in and however they're prepared or not. Um, and let's say, okay, well, based on what the numbers say and everything else that's in the business, um, this is the price that we can likely get, right? And then the, the owner's mm -hmm. like, I really wanted more than that, right? So, so yeah. what, what happens there in that discussion? Is, is it then, well, what can we do to then increase it? And we don't go through the sales process now so that we can get to where we want to be? Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're a small dedicated team, um, which means when we take a, a deal to market, we need to win and we need to get it closed. Now, COVID, you know, there's stuff that comes up that, but, but we never want to throw a flyer in the market and, and just try and snag a premium valuation if we don't think it's realistic because the sales process is, it's expensive, it's, it's long, it, it, it takes time and, and, you end up with a lot of disappointment and hurt feelings if, if you don't, you're not successful. So, um, you know, assuming there's enough of a delta between what the seller wants and what we think he or she can get, um, we'll, we'll often give them some advice as to how to get there and some, some data points and benchmarks for them to, uh, to try and pursue to, to get that valuation that they want. Yeah, nice. I think, I know you obviously you're like an M&A specialist as well, and this could be one of the strategies, right? Where you go, hey, well, we, we've got this much profit right now, but if we get a little bit more EBITDA, you know, it will exponentially grow to this next part. So maybe, uh, you know, we look at who, who are some competitors in the industry, can we buy them? Um, and then then you go out to the private equities or the other parties and, and then go, you know, we'll get a lot bigger multiples. Is that sort of potentially some of the strategies that you look at as well? Yeah, that's exactly right. And it's a really... A, a attractive way to, to grow a business. You can obviously grow organically or you can grow inorganically through acquisitions, even down to what we would call aqua hires, which are, you know, let's say there's just, you're in a very people intensive business uh, where, where people and relationships with customers matter. Maybe you're buying, you know, a, a five to 10 person firm. Seller doesn't really 
have an option other than to kind of sell to a strategic and, and you pick up some revenue, you pick up some profitability and one plus one can equal three in that scenario, especially if it takes your EBITDA from, you know, the three range to the six range or, or, or five, you're, you're, you know, you're getting that bump up in valuation premium because you've sort of uh, achieved a different hurdle. So absolutely that can be a, a really um, a, attractive way to, to grow. And there's some, I imagine there's the same in Australia. I know there is in the UK, but there's some attractive debt um, solutions where, you know, responsible companies with great cash flow can use some debt um, to make uh, relatively inexpensive debt to, to make acquisitions that can obviously grow uh, their top line and bottom line. Yeah, nice. Love that. Um, let's talk a bit about the emotional challenges now. I think this is a good one here, right? Now, depending on, on the person, whether they're left or right brain, um, you know, it can be a bit different, but, you know, especially if someone's growing the business themselves, right? And maybe think it's their baby or they're like, oh, they built it from the ground up and everything like that. And they're going through this process. What are some of the challenges you see when you're working with these people to then be able to get it to where you want to be without that, you know, their emotions sort of clouding and making it challenging? Yeah, that that's the number one thing that we we try and do up front to really get clear vision and alignment as to goals and why they're why they're doing this and, and what the outcome is going to be. And it's just all of the range of human emotions and fear and greed and, um, you know, the same skills that drive someone to succeed in scaling a business can actually at times be an impediment in, in the m a process because folks are used to doing things themselves. They're used to taking the bull by the horns. They're used to not delegating. They're used to wearing a bunch of different hats. And in the sale process, it's really important to, to stick to your lane, so to speak, and uh, allow us to do what we do well and, and, and sellers keep running their business. But you have to really get clear on the emotional side of things. And, um, you know, my, my partner, Bobby, who's exceptional at dealing with our clients when, uh, you know, they're leading up to that sale and it's really stressful. And, you know, she'll be talking to them five, six, 10 times a day. And actually we had a recent client who um, we went through a, a very lucrative, but a very challenging sale process. And, and he called her a week later uh, from his boat in the Caribbean and said, Hey, um, I just want to thank you, but I also feel like we've broken up because he was so used to talking to her multiple times a day um, leading up to the sales. So that's that's a huge part of what we do, and and a massive um, challenge and opportunity in dealing with you know privately held family owned businesses. Yeah, nice, love that. Uh, let's get into due diligence now. I think this is an important topic because obviously once, you know, there's maybe some base terms or people want to know more about the business, you've signed the NDA and everything and you, you're seeing what's under the hood. And that's why obviously the preparation is important to make sure they're they're seeing mostly good stuff uh, or hopefully all good stuff under there. Um, what, what happens? Like what is shared? Because I think sometimes, especially maybe for a strategic buyer, right? That there could be a little bit of, mm -hmm apprehension here as well you know from my side of going well if i just showed them everything will they just go and do it right and and then you know get out of the deal maybe there's a bit of fear there but there's also obviously wanting to still share if they're even not a strategic buyer with everybody to make sure that you know it's there so what sh should we be doing and not doing i guess in that due diligence process so that we're protecting ourselves but also giving ourselves the best chance for people to um yeah give us the best you know price and, and valuation yeah um Working with working with an advisor that's done it is is huge because what we do is build in milestones. So we're not we're not showing people information until they're proving to us along the way that they're serious about a deal, and that's usually in the form of them spending time and money on it. Um, and, and you get to a point where obviously you're going to have to reveal everything, uh, but that is only post letter of intent when you're dealing with one specific buyer. And, and you two are engaged, so to speak, with an idea of, of closing the transaction. So it's just being strategic about what you're showing people when. Obviously, you're signing a non-disclosure agreement. Um, and, you know, there's some basic financials and other stuff that you, you're sharing early in the process. But things like customer lists or giving people access to, you know, a certain level of employee, that doesn't come until, until well down the road. And, and in terms of due diligence, generally... You know, there's two phrases we like to say. One is run to your problems. So if you know there's something in due diligence that 
um, is not great. Maybe it's a tax issue. Maybe you've got a, a pending or threatened lawsuit from a former employee. Whatever it is, get out in front of that. Manage that because it will come out. And if it comes out um, without you bringing it to the buyer's attention, uh, that does a, a lot of harm in, in breaching sort of the perceived trust. And, and um, you know, the other phrase we say is drama kills deals. And you don't want surprises um, when you're well into the due diligence process. You want people going in eyes wide open and, and you know, hopefully having resolved any questions around, um, you know, due diligence, um, black marks, you know, very early, um, well before you're, you're, you know, about to close. Yeah, no, I love that, man. Really powerful. Um, let, let's talk about terms now, because I think this is really important, right? Because there's a lot of different types of terms. Like I, I look at acquiring businesses as well. So, you know, understanding it from being the buying side as well. Like I don't necessarily, um, you know, want to put all of the money up front for whatever reason, right, in the deal um, and how we structure that. And and I guess, you know, sometimes it's, it's a lot of changing the mindset and the mentality of the seller sometimes, right. About this, because they're like, Oh, then I just get this big bucket of money and, and, and go off, uh, which can be good, but it also can be bad for tax purposes as well. Um, yeah. you know, if you, if you get it all in one hit with capital gains and all those other things. So do you want to maybe talk a little bit about maybe some of these different key different terms, I guess, that we could use in, in structuring the deal okay. and, and I guess the benefits of those um, so that there's a bit of a connection between, you know, the buyer and the seller side that will ultimately likely get it over the line, uh, you know, in the end. Yeah, you said something very important there, which is connection or another way to say it is alignment. And, and the best transactions we've been a part of are where buyer and seller are, are aligned going forward after the deal. And and that's whether or not, you know, that maybe the CEO is doing a, a short six month transition and then he or she is traveling the world or playing golf every day. Or uh, it's it's obviously crucial if the seller is, say, selling 65 or 70 percent of the business and continuing on um, with a new partner. So um, the, the, the best way to think about purchase price, which is what is the business valued at as a whole, is you've got two components. You've got the cash at closing piece. And that is just what it sounds like. It's the amount of uh, cash that the buyer is giving to the seller at closing. Um, and then you've got um, contingent or, or back-end consideration. And that is really in, in three buckets, uh, at least it, that we've seen in the private markets where we play. Um, you've got an earnout. So an earnout is a, uh, a form of consideration that is tied to the future performance of the business. It could be tied to revenue could be tied to EBITDA, could be tied to customer retention. Um, but it's a way of um, aligning the buyer and seller and, and the buyer saying, okay, I believe what you've built is great, but you've also got to prove it to me over the next two years or three years. And, and assuming it is what it purports to be, you're going to get some more money. Um, the other element of contingent consideration is equity. So some sellers are only selling 60 or 70% of the business. Maybe they're taking 15% in an earnout, and then the remaining 15% in some carried equity so that they're going to get uh, that second bite at the apple down the road. Because remember, most private equity firms, their mandate is to buy a business, grow it from five to seven years, um, and then sell it again. And so we've, we've been fortunate to be part of transactions where we sold the initial you know, majority stake, um, but we also helped bank the, the, um, the subsequent transaction. And in, you know, in some cases, the minority equity that the, the seller retains can be worth more than the original uh, percentage that they sold. And, and so that's um, a very popular form of, of, you know, buyer and seller being aligned as well. And the third bucket is less common um, historically when debt capital was so cheap. It's, we've seen more of it in the last two years now with interest rates, and that's the seller notes, which is where the seller agrees to take a portion of the purchase price um, as a subordinated debt instrument. And so the seller essentially becomes a creditor of the business and they're usually behind, you know, some senior or bank debt. And that's again, an additional way for the seller to get some purchase price, um, you know, some additional consideration without it being paid um, right up front at closing. Yeah. Awesome. Love that. So, uh, so important to understand these things, right? So that, yeah, you're not going to get it all up front and then, um, yeah, work in there. And, and it just proves that that the system will continue to work um, there. And, and what, what do you find? Because um, I, I like there's the, 
the second bite of the cherry type of thing that you said, where there's the part sale. And that can also help bring down the cost, right? Where you don't have to buy the whole business as well as, as the buyer. So that can work there. But but some people might just want to go, I want to buy the whole business because maybe the, the seller wants to just get out, right? And, and whatever like that, for whatever reason, and doesn't, you know, want to have any, any anything to do with it after that. So are you seeing more than one or the other? Or like, what are you seeing in the market of what's sort of working, um, you know, to, to get that alignment? Yeah, I'd say 80 to 90 percent of our transactions involve sellers that are between, say, 45 and 55 who are just selling a percentage and and carrying on with the business with with a new financial or strategic partner. Now, that may mean their role changes. So maybe they don't want to be CEO. They want to just do business development or product and engineering Um or maybe they only want to be CEO, but they were wearing too many hats. And, and part of the transaction is to bring in some help operationally. Um, one or two times out of 10, it is a seller who says, I want to sort of ride off into the sunset, so to speak. And, you know, I'll, I'll agree to stay on for a three to six month transition. And then, you know, turn over the, you know, the business is yours. Um, you know, they're going to get less value. Uh, overall value in those types of transaction because they're higher risk for the buyer, um, but it can be the right deal. And, and we've done plenty of those. I actually think in the coming years, they may increase. And, and the reason I say that is demographics. So I think there's a lot of businesses that are owned by um, baby boomer generation who, for whatever reason, um, don't have a succession plan. Maybe, maybe the kids don't want to take over the business and, uh, it's not right to turn over to an employee where they'll make the decision to just sell this asset and you know and sell 100% of it. Uh, we'll see if I'm right, uh, but but those um, those are really the two scenarios that we see most often. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing that as well uh, in Australia. Uh, you know, it's growing here with the stats where people are getting older, and there's a lot of reasons for them to sell. Um, you know, whether it's just retirement or. You know, there's a hundred different reasons, um, you know, why that could happen um, yeah. now, but it's it's an older generation. The kids don't want to take over the business, right? Um, and then it's like they want to do YouTube or whatever, you know, they're thinking yeah. of these yeah. days. And, um, being yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to run your widget company. I want to be a TikTok star. And you're like, <laughs> okay, well, you know, and then when they're 35, they're going to get mad at their father and mother for selling the widget co and they realize the thing was spitting off, you know, $3 million of free cash flow every year. But, you know, uh, we all we all have our journeys. That's right. Maybe you can do both. Maybe for the youngsters out there that are thinking about that. Um, but yeah, maybe you can do both. Um, but yeah, it's it's an interesting one, but you learn a lot um, from those things. So yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting market. So let's talk about the employees now, because I think this is a big one, right? And whether this is the business under full management, which is amazing, or whether they obviously the owner's um, part of it, and it's going to be a transition and everything like that. <clears throat> How do we manage this? Because people may or may not know that it's being sold. And then you've got potentially a new culture coming in right after this, and you want to make sure you retain, you know, everyone, um, or at least all the good eggs um, in, in the business um, to, to, you know, continue the momentum and everything like that. So how, how, how do we manage that so that it's, you know, smooth transition? Yeah, that's a huge piece of it. And, and one of the, the very first questions we asked, because sellers are different in terms of, you know, how, how important that is to him. We had a seller who used to boast about the fact that he had put, I think it was 75 kids of his employees through college. Um, so obviously, the notion of the new owner coming in and really taking care of those people and that culture was of paramount importance to him, even more so than squeezing every dollar of purchase price out of the deal. So um, those are important discussions. You're, you're going to want to start with um, the folks who are important to be part of the actual deal. Um, so if there are you know important folks that the buyer is going to want to speak to and interview and and hear their vision. Um, you need to bring them into the fold in a strategic way and make sure that they they see the vision for the, the why the sale is happening and, and that they're going to have a role going forward. You can do that through some equity or, or stock incentive um, type plans. Most good buyers will come in and, and really try and keep those people with some some economic profit sharing or stock or or what have you. Um, and so it, 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 it's case by case, but it, it depends on sort of how important the people are to actually closing the transaction versus the broader census uh, of employees who are going to be involved in, in the day to day and the timing of telling them um, can usually be 
you know, right before the closing of the deal or, or right after. And there's a whole uh, cottage industry of what we would call in the States integration specialists that come in and help buyers with communicating new culture and figuring out who's doing what and, and making sure those employees stick around. But yeah, it, it, you know, for most of the services businesses that we're involved with, it's, it's the most important asset that the company has. Yeah, definitely. Um, love that. So let, let's just talk a little bit more about the involvement of the owner, say, and, and especially if they want to get out, right? Um, you know, to an extent, they want to go into the sunset like we've been talking about or whatever it is like that on the beaches and, and, and everything. Um, how long, ideally, should we be keeping them? Like as the buyer or everything like that, and, and the seller also, because they want to continue their legacy a lot of the time. They want to make sure the business is successful. So you don't want to just, you know, a week later, I'm off guys. And then, you know, good luck and you can't reach me. Um, you want to make sure that there's enough time period there for, for the transition. And, and I guess what the involvement is, right, on that area there, like, do we just focus on the relationships? Because that might be key, right? You know, that, that the, the new owners need to do or the new management team need. And, and so how long, how long should that period be, do you think, um, so that, you're really setting yourself up, you know, for that transition for success. Yeah, it's a delicate balance. Um, you know, what we've seen most often is sort of six to 12 months. Um, I think you need you need the, the seller around for enough time to transition the relationships, to offer advice on best practices. Certainly if you're, you know, getting up to speed on a new industry, um, you know, all that's, all that's very important. And, you know, I haven't seen much shorter than six months because six months is actually not a long time. Um, you know, in business and especially with a, an integration plan where one company buys another. Um, but the reason I say it's a delicate balance is because people are involved. And, you know, anytime a seller knows that he or she is, you know, has got one foot out the door, um, they just got a pile of cash dumped in their lap, the, the hustle factor goes down, right? The, the, the drive, the energy, the willingness to show up at the office at six in the morning, you know, that stuff, just human nature is going to diminish. And, and, and for most of these folks, they haven't had a boss for quite a long time. And so there can be conflicting visions and, and some, some friction there around, you know, them letting go and, and the new, the new ownership, you know, taking the reins. And so, you know, it, it, what, what we've seen work well is that sort of six to 12 month period. And then maybe the owner transitions to a board role where he or she can, you know, offer strategic advice or maybe help identify competitors for acquisition or, or what have you. But that tends to be what we've seen in terms of timelines for, for those sellers that are wanting to leave the business in the short term. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. Um, so I think we learn a lot more from failure, right? Where we learn um, <laughs> rather than just talking about all the good stuff that happens um, and a lot of mistakes that people can do. So just generally, what do you think that you're seeing either directly or indirectly are some of the bigger failures or common mistakes you think that, you know, these business owners are making when selling their business and, and you know, how that they can be avoided as well? Yeah, the first one's trying to go it alone. I know I keep harping on this, um, but it's it's a very, very difficult process to, um, to manage and, um, you know, it, it can become very distracting. You know, one of, one of the favorite tactics of buyers, if they know that they've got a, 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 you know, a disintermediated seller, a seller that there's no advisor working is to, is to sort of wear them down, give them due diligence requests, get information and then, you know, drag it out and, and hope that the attrition and, and the annoyance of it all will, will, result in the seller for maybe maybe selling the business for less than it's worth. Um, so number one is trying to do it yourself. Number two, again, is um, trying to sweep under the rug, you know, issues with the business or in due diligence. Um, and number three is sort of taking your eye off the ball at those, that crucial month leading up to closing. Um, one of the first deals I worked on, and this was really, uh, really challenging, but, but it kind of goes to show is, um, you know, the seller had, struck a great deal. It was going to be very lucrative. And, and, and he went out and did something, you know, pretty improper, um, right up leads, leading to the closing marital infidelity, let's put it that way. And, and it, and it got back to his wife. He filed for an injunction to stop the transaction to make sure that it was the right value. The buyer said, Whoa, this reflects some really poor judgment. We're walking away. And, and he lost his biggest customer. Now that's obviously kind of a, 
an out there example, but it just, you know, you really got to remain diligent and focused leading up to closing because until the ink is dry on the contract and the money changes hands, there's still stuff that can go wrong. Yeah, definitely love that. Um, so true learning off, off all these uh, mistakes and failures. Um, so yeah, it's been a, it's been a powerful episode, mate, that you've, uh, you know, shared with us today. Uh, and I guess as we're, we're starting to wrap up one, what one key piece of advice would you like to give the all the entrepreneurs and, and business owners that are watching this today? Wherever you are in your journey, whether you're just starting out, whether you've been doing it for 20 years, um, continue to think about and refine your end goal for the business. And that could be to never sell it, to turn it over to your family or to, to keep it as an annuity stream well into the future. Or it, could, or it could be to sell it to the employees or it could be to sell it to a third party. But, um, you know, every maybe every six months or every quarter, um, really think about your why. Why do you continue to love running the business? Why are you building this business? And and where do you hope where do you hope to go with it? You know, in a three to five year time frame, and you know that that has a way of seeping into everything you do, and and you'll find you make better decisions when you've really got that end game in mind. Yeah, awesome, love that. So so true. Um, uh, yeah, we connected. Uh, you know, through our networks, I learned about your awesome journey from uh, you know from the law side to uh, you know being the founding partner at, at Brighthorn and investor and board member. Uh, awesome guy, very knowledgeable um, in this space. I'm sure you continue to help uh, business owners, management teams and boards, the information they need to decide when to sell a business or, or raise capital. Um, you know, very grateful that we connected and, and look forward to working with you. So um, yeah, Brett, how can people find you getting in contact with you? Yeah, the easiest thing is uh, via our website, brighthorn.com. Uh, there's a contact form on there. I'm always happy to talk to business owners in a informal and, and pro bono basis to, to help give some perspective. I can also be found uh, on LinkedIn, Brett's story. And uh, Ethan, I share those sentiments. It's been uh, really enjoyable speaking with you. Always like to connect with folks uh, down under and and hopefully some, some people found this to be uh, insightful. Yeah, awesome, mate. Definitely check out Brett there on the website. Reach out, as you can see, wealth of knowledge and, um, you know, can obviously help you uh, if you're in that 10 to 100 million range um, and, and wanting to, you know, sell your business. So reach out to him there. And um, it's been a pleasure interviewing you, mate. And thanks for being on my show. Sure thing. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, for watching and listening to this show where we talk about everything on business growth. And please like, subscribe, and leave us a five-star review. You can find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube as Ethan Cassiotis, or visit my website, ethancassiotis.com. If you want to grow and scale your business, you can reach out to me on any platform to see if we're a good fit. I completely agree with you, or do I? The only way you know is if you tune in next time. So until next time, remember that our business grows when we learn skills and take action using them in spite of fear. So remember to design your growth and results. Thank you.